Hello and welcome to the MIT Open Doc Lab talk. My name is Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the lab. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce Duncan Speakman, who's doing some really interesting work exploring how immersive and augmented artworks might offer ways to engage with the climate collapse. In his work, he asked participants to engage with the environment around us, the environment and climate issues, as well as digital technologies and political and social constructs and the relationships between all of these. He creates work that pushes us out of that cocoon that immersive media so often creates. Duncan is an artist and composer resident at the per, uh, Pervasive Media Studio in Bristol, England. He works often with mobile audio and locative media. He creates narrative experiences that engage audience emotionally and physically in uncontrolled spaces. From intimate in-ear stories to large scale performances, his award-winning projects range from sound installations on Gangdao tram radio, uh, networks and loudspeaker symphonies in Christchurch to performative audio walks in Saitama and radio works for the BBC. His current research explores the role of augmented audio in critical ecology, and he continues to wrap his questions in melancholy and romance. Before I hand it over to Duncan, I just want to remind people if you have questions to put them in the Q&A. We'll have some time at the end of his talk for your questions, and we hope to get to as many as possible. And without further ado, uh, Duncan Speakman. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm just going to share my screen. And OK. Um, so I'm Duncan Speakman. These are my details. Um, I'm not going to say much about myself um, for now. I this talk is a sort of remix of a talk I gave uh, a couple of years ago at IDFA, so apologies for people who might have heard this one before. Um, and it's going to jump around a lot in time. Uh, so we're actually going to start in 1361 in Halberstadt in Germany, uh, where the first sort of installed organ in a cathedral was placed. And 639 years later than that, a group of composers got together and they decided to stage a performance of a work by John Cage called As Slow As Possible, which is a work composed for organ with no uh, fixed duration. So they decided as the organ had been there 639 years, they would stage a performance of this work that would last 639 years. The piece began in 2001 and the composition begins with a rest and that rest lasted for two and a half years. So the first note was heard in 2003 and it sounded like this. So I've been trying to understand this word immersion, which recently seems to have become a shorthand for specific types of media and performance. It's immersion as some kind of cultural signifier, immersion as a noun or as a verb. I'm thinking that immersion might mean looking outwards, listening outwards. Immersion might just mean there's no vantage point on a situation. And it feels that everyone is leaning towards this act of immersing as a kind of cocooning. Immersive media is a thing that wraps around us. Instead, I want to think about immersion as something that already exists, something that we live with all the time. Immersion is the way of describing how we exist deep inside complex, tangled ecologies. And around this word, beyond it, underneath it, and even woven within it, maybe we'll find agendas of care of attending to the environments we inhabit. Immersion might just mean there is no vantage point. It's the end of summer in 2003 and I'm sitting in a church in Somerset listening to the album Untitled 197 by Francisco Lopez. 
Over 45 minutes, waves of resonant metallic tones slowly build in volume. Starting from a silence, I strain to listen in until the point where I'm entirely consumed by the sound field. And as the volume continues to rise steadily, I almost consider getting up to turn the amplifier down. But I resist, I commit myself to the experience. Suddenly it stops and it appears the world has been silenced. An incredibly high-pitched tone fills the now empty space and I'm not sure if it's my ears or a final parting shot by the composer. As this doubt plays around in my head, a gentle hissing sound begins to appear, entwining itself with the doubtful tone. The hiss becomes a patter and I realise it started to rain outside. My listening becomes stretched from the speakers to the room, to the world outside, and there is no barrier between them and I know exactly where I am sitting in a church in Somerset surrounded by fields and weather. But my attention has been shifted. My initial focus into the faint traces of a sound recording led me to shut out my surroundings. And yet now, here I was at the end, completely aware of my existing surroundings, of my place within them, of shifting seasons and changing weather. In listening to the Lopez piece, the sound became a true vignette, the edges of the sonic image blurring into the canvas. My immersion was an existing condition. The sound had not created it, only highlighted it. The fuzzy edges of the transition let multiple things interweave. It let things coexist. I've been making audio walks for about 15 years. Um, Geolocated pieces, early real-time mobile sound processing works where I was sending people out with laptops in backpacks. My walks, um, the sound walks I make, they're not information based, they're not telling you histories of locations. They're often quite reflective, casting you as a protagonist, asking you to engage with the physical, social and political environments that you're in. And even when I was just using pre-recorded media, I always thought about them as augmented reality. The world has changed and I do say they are audio AR now. But crucially, my composition process has always worked with the mantra of leaving space for the world to happen, because the world is almost always going to be more interesting than anything you can make. So the audio acts as a kind of frame. I don't want to fill the audience's experience up with information I've created. I want to use the work as a way of exposing and highlighting the, the sort of spaces they're in. And when we're creating works that exist in real environments, then maybe we do need the content to have a dialogue with it, not just overlaying it. If your augmented reality is presented on a tabletop, is that tabletop a crucial part of the mise-en-scene or is it just to hand? This sense of a dialogue between the real and the virtual might be considered interactive, but I'm drawn to Karen Barad's idea that interaction assumes that they're separate entities. And instead she uses this term intra-action, which is the mutual, mutual constitution of entangled agencies. Entangled, entanglement. Barad describes entanglement as not simply to be entwined with another, as in the joining of separate entities, but to lack an independent self-contained existence. In the work I make, I'm trying to, um, the work I make that I'm gonna talk about in a bit, the digital content is only part of it. And without the site, the environment that the audience experience it in, it's incomplete. It can't exist independently. Entanglement is a, is a very fashionable word right now and as a concept it's been mobilised by a wide range of people who are seeking to move beyond a worldview where the human is seen as exceptional and this is something I'll come back to. What I want to think about is that in creating that dialogue between digital content and a real world, I don't just mean context sensitive software, different files playing when it's night time or knowing you've entered a geographic area. What I'm interested in is, does the virtual content care about what's going on around it? And maybe more importantly, does it make you care what's going on around you? When we sit in a cinema or in a VR headset, we're often expected to forget everything else, to forget the rest of the reality we're immersed in. This is one of the reasons we're asked to be quiet in the cinema, because we're not part of that world. 
And in VR, we've usually got headphones on, although I've heard it as a regular complaint in exhibitions that, oh, I could hear all the other people in the space and it was distracting. When we think about augmented reality, these rules don't apply so easily. You can't just tell the world to stop being so distracting. Augmenting reality is playing with the fire of the world and it's easy to get burnt. It's also very easy to think we're doing something new, something that wasn't possible before. But I think there are legacies of site-specific performance that have already understood how to augment our reality. Artists who've been creating experiences in uncontrolled spaces for a long time. Um, when I say uncontrolled spaces, I use that term rather than public space because public space is um, a legal term. It kind of defines a common law area. And when you talk about making an artwork in public space, people often think, oh, you mean walking around a city. But actually in contemporary cities, a lot of the environment is actually private, um, demarcated by small markings in the ground. What I'm interested in is actually the fact that you don't have control over that environment. You don't have control what's going to happen, the kind of interventions that might, that might happen. So one of the people that has worked with this for a long time is Alan Caprow, um, who was making work in the 60s. You might know him from his happenings, which were sort of hipsters getting together to, in lofts to just do stuff, unplanned art events, lots of paint, mess, probably food everywhere. But these sort of um, DIY impromptu events, they also became, as he described, saddled with an art history that they would replace. His real question was, what is an authentic experience? How could you stir the modern audience from its cosy, emotional anesthesia? He wanted to break the wall that separated life from art and allow us to participate in its unfolding in the reality of our existence. So the happenings changed from these kind of constructed art events to quite often being simply a set of instructions um, to be carried out by performers. This set of instructions here is from a work from 1967. Um, these instructions would be followed by people. They would happen essentially unannounced, uh, performed somewhere in the world. And they'd be choreographies that created subtle shifts in the everyday landscape for anyone that happened to be there. Now, these are sometimes described as non-matrixed performances. So, a traditional theatre form is a matrix of time, place and character, separate to that of the audience. But if in that show you were to see a technician move a light, this would be non-matrixed. And it's a choice for us about how we treat these non-matrixed events. When we blur the distinction between the real and the virtual and augmented experiences, Shouldn't we acknowledge that technician moving the lights? It's easy to forget when we're working with reality that it's not the same for everyone. When we position someone inside a work, is that audience member present in the piece? Not just as a mute listener or impotent observer, but as a physical body with embodied experience. When we position that same body into the world, into an uncontrolled environment, how much responsibility do we take for their dialogue with the world? Have we kept them safe? A safe environment is not a universal concept. Placing audiences in the world is not as simple as making sure they avoid cars. Individual experiences of environments are also shaped by existing cultural tensions of gender, race, class and much more. Augmenting reality is playing with the fire of the world and it's easy to get burnt. So the non-matrix nature of an augmented experience means that it brings in the rest of the world. The environment we experience the work in becomes entangled in the work itself and that environment is changing rapidly. It is collapsing. It's autumn 2017. I'm in the first stages of building my new project, Only Expansion. I'm standing high on a, up on a rooftop in Bergen at night. I can just make out the shape of the mountains. 
Below me, the lights of the boats and buildings mark out the edges of the black surface of the harbour water. I'm wearing a pair of headphones with binaural microphones attached to the outside. They feed in and out of a small embedded computing device. I can hear cars on the street below and the faint cries of revellers. I begin playing a recording of desert wind through the device. The pre-recording and the live are mixed together in my ears. Even though I know what it looked like, I do not picture the edge of the Sahara where it was recorded. Instead, it just seems to become weather around me and I can only see the harbour below. But slowly the wind from the sea picks up and I begin to feel both winds on my face. So the work I was making, Only Expansion, is an augmented audio experience. It uses uh, a pair of headphones with binaural microphones attached on the outside, a small device that you can see in this image, and a guidebook. The guidebook is not a, um, a site-specific work. This is designed to work anywhere. What you get in the guidebook is prompts, um, suggestions of how to move through the city to look for a vantage point, to look for the quietest place. What you hear in the headphones initially is a music score, and then gradually it begins to play in field recordings from different locations around the world where um, I've been making recordings. So you might hear the sound of rising sea levels um, on the coast of Norway or Louisiana, or you might hear areas of desertification in Tunisia. The microphones on the outside of the headphones let the sound of the city that you're in feed into that and mix together with those sounds. Then gradually, the software in the device starts processing these sounds around you. So as you hear the recording of rising sea levels, the sound of the city next to you also starts sounding as if it's underwater. It starts being filtered and processed so you're sort of hearing the flooded future of the city that you're in. And this happens in different ways in different parts of the piece. At some moments it simulates the sound of the world around you burning, at other moments of being in the desert. Um, I keep hearing a little bit of crackling on my voice. I'm not sure if that's coming through to you as well. I hope not. Uh, maybe someone can let me know in the chat if it is. So this, this, work for, this work for me is um, trying to offer an understanding of the Anthropocene. Um, the Anthropocene, a term coined by Paul Crutzen in 2000, is generally considered to describe a new geological epoch of significant human impact on the Earth. Its geological specification and categorization are still widely debated, but despite this, it's become a powerful um, cultural concept. I use the term here as a sort of form of shorthand rather than the specificity of the geological. It's used as a way to frame contemporary ecological perspectives about human impact, to speak towards climate breakdown and broad notions of environmental crisis. It is a problematic term. The Anthropocene is predicated on exploitation, on colonialism, slavery, genocide, and any claim to be uh, an equitably responsible human issue subjugates all these kind of brutalities. Uh, quite often the people leading the Anthropocene are not the ones being affected by it. But we will stick with this term for now because something is happening. So the Anthropocene is um, a question for me of scale, of the local and the global. We have this uh, ubiquitous slogan of think global, act local, suggesting that an approach to addressing the planetary scale of the Anthropocene means you have to attend to your immediate environment first. But our local places, ecologies and cultural practices are constantly reconfigured by global networks. So maybe we need to think bigger in space and in time. Local is, of course, relative. On a city scale, local might mean my street. In astronomy, local might mean our solar system. 
And if we're going to create narratives that seek to follow planetary timescales, humans might be reduced to the status of minor characters. Ursula Heiser talks about about trying to have a species narrative approach that involves abandoning individual humans as narrative actants, replacing them instead with entire species. How do we begin to describe this kind of interpenetration between the domestic and the planetary? How do we shift the core of our cultural imagination from a sense of place to a less territorial and more systematic sense of planet? One of the problems for me is this idea of setting up nature as being over there, this kind of pristine wilderness with no human contact, where we look at a picture of a lonely polar bear or a collapsing glacier. For me, what happens then is it disguises the entanglement. As Christopher Morton describes, if we could not merely figure out, but actually experience the fact that we were embedded in our world, then we would be less likely to destroy it. I think that sound, and especially audio augmented reality, might offer a route towards this, along two threads. The first being time, because sound is an inherently temporal medium. In 2013, the organ note changed to this. The historian Deepesh Chakrabarti says that to consider the Anthropocene is to see how human history has collided with two timescales. Has co sorry, has collided with the timescales of two histories, the time of evolution of life on our planet and geological time. But maybe the Anthropocene is simply a way of framing time. Maybe that if we are to understand it and to feel its temporality as more than just an abstract theory, we might need to become attuned to the different rates of change that compose it. As humans, we understand only a restricted range of rhythms, and many of the timescales of the Anthropocene exist outside of these, from the hydraulic slowness of starfish migration to decaying nuclear fuel waste that must be managed far beyond our individual lifespans. Our contemporary existence is the uncanny sense of existing on more than one time scale at once. When we use pre-recorded media in an augmented reality experience, this embodies this experience of multiple simultaneous timelines, but it can get really messy. Here, I'm still talking and I'm acting as if I'm talking to you now in the present, but actually this voice was recorded a few hours ago you can see me now, but you're hearing me in the past. My lips aren't moving, but because you've been watching me, you can associate the voice with my face. And two moments in time sort of become one. In many sound walks and augmented experiences, I find people throwing in this kind of content, a recorded voice from the past speaking as if it's present, telling you to turn left or right, to look up at a tree. For our brains, that's actually quite a complex experience to comprehend, even before we get to any kind of story or narrative. In my work, Only Expansion, I tried to use this kind of complexity to create an experience of multiple human and non-human timescales. When you're walking through a city and hear a field recording of a rising ocean, you know it's from another time and place in the past, but you can still hear your immediate surroundings. But gradually, as the software processes those surroundings to sound as if they're underwater, you're hearing a distant future of your city. You're simultaneously in the past, present and future but somehow still tied to your human physicality in that place, there and now. While this kind of layering speaks to the multiple timelines of the Anthropocene, sound offers an even more entangled experience. If you're listening on speakers now, you're probably hearing some birds and a forest. Um, if you're listening on headphones, you can still hear them, but maybe you can't hear the other sounds around you. The thing that's really complex about sound, and I don't really want to get into a deep philosophical uh, line here. Um, I don't want to follow the uh, tree falls in a forest line. 
But there's a difference between the things that make the sounds and you hearing the sounds. So a, a simple way to understand that is the idea of a sound object, which is the moment you're hearing the sound, the moment you're identifying it, the moment it's getting to your ear and you're interpreting it. And there's also the sound event, the thing that made the sound in the first place. So these sounds at the moment, you weren't there when they were made, um, but you're hearing them now. And importantly, whenever we're listening to a soundscape, we're not just listening to it, we're also generating, we're also creating sounds. As you hear these birds and forest sounds in the environment you're in right now, you're also potentially hearing the rustling of your clothes, the noise of things happening outside the room you're in. Uh, you might be even hearing your own breath or your heartbeat. And all those sounds are merging together at the point of you listening to them. There is no separation. The background collapses into the foreground. And then there is the viscerality of sound, the fact that it's literally physically invading your body. And I've been following this viscerality towards a darkness. A dark where maybe we should stop focusing on a culturally constructed beauty of the imagined natural world, but rather start looking at the horror of what is to come. Robert McFarlane points at a darker ecological impulse in which salvation and self-knowledge can no longer be found in a mountain peak or a stooping falcon, and categories such as the picturesque or even the beautiful congeal into kitsch. Sound can offer us the horror of the unknown, the inherent ambiguity of what is making that sound. Where is it coming from? As Am Kangisa says, sound might make us aware of registers that are unfamiliar, inaccessible, and maybe even monstrous. Registers that are wholly indifferent to the play of human, dra of human drama. This fantasy of the imagined beautiful natural world, it might create some kind of distance between the environment and us. Perhaps a practice of dark nature recording could actually begin to reflect the totality of an ecology from which we are inseparable. In the non-matrixed experience of augmented reality where the virtual and the real content are entangled, the background and the foreground collapse into each other. And maybe at this moment hu humans move out of the spotlight a bit and we start thinking about reality not just as what we perceive, but as something bigger than us. Maybe what augmented reality might do is, it's, is start to at least highlight these entanglements rather than constructed separations and let us experience them rather than just show them. Entanglement as a concept isn't the solution. Um, Eva Garad points out that if everything is entangled and everything acts on everything else, it becomes difficult to point a finger of blame or know what needs to be done to engender more responsible relationships. But experiencing entanglement is a start at least. This is the offer of a non-matrixed space. If we use augmented reality not as an overlay, but as a way to draw reality in, to make it an active part of the content, so that neither the real or the virtual have an independent, self-contained existence, we might create new forms of attending to our surroundings and of experiencing our place within them. If this story is one of entanglement of scale, from microbial to massive, and from the immediate present to geological time, then to tell it, to understand it, maybe we do need new modes of attention, modes of attention that are not the curiously static subject-object contemplation produced by encountering the scale of ecological disaster, of looking at videos of melting glaciers or epic coal fields. If approaching the Anthropocene is about attending to the variegated processes of change, of these multiple interwoven timescales of both the human and the non-human, it is not just present within the thematics of the work, 
but actually in the inherent structural form of augmented reality. So I'd suggest that the content of a work doesn't even need to be specifically ecologically focused. The entanglement of time space that happens in AR has the ability to collapse together the background into the foreground. And in doing so, time frames, visual spaces, political spaces can collapse into each other too. Maybe this reminds us that the world is not for humans, the world is rather with humans. The organ note changed in 2020 to this. It will keep playing as long as humans or robots are left to maintain it until the year 2640, when we'll all be dead but the traces of our actions will surely live on. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Duncan, for this uh, incredibly uh, thoughtful presentation. So much to think about. I'm going to open it up to uh, the panelists uh, and see if there are any questions or comments. Kelly? Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you. I've spent a lot of time thinking about like Karen Barad's work, and I thought you really brought some of those challenging concepts to life in a really impressive way. Thank you. Um, and I guess my question is kind of related to that of uh, on kind of a method methodological level, how, how you kind of first started thinking about moving some of those theories into kind of the real world. So I liked, for example, you're like sitting with the headphones and thinking about space and the interaction between what you were hearing and your physical space. But if you could just talk more about um, the, the process of making concrete some of these things that are sometimes hard to figure out how to make concrete? Um, like really a practice-based methodology in the sense that I was making the work before um, sort of coming across the kind of theories in a way. So, so I was working with um, kind of augmented audio, this kind of real time processing, and was really interested in this blur that was happening between the the pre recorded and the, the real time sounds being processed. Um, I'm just getting a bit of sorry, I'm just going to swap my mic over because I'm getting a bit of crackle on here at the moment. Um, uh, um, can you hear me normally now? Does that sound okay? Hello? No. Um, oh, it's a little soft. It's soft. The crackle crackling only happens occasionally. Uh, so okay, so we'll we'll stay with this thing so with you can it. hear me. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, so I was making that work, and I was I was using the word entangled. I was I was talking about these sounds um, being entangled, and I was already interested in uh, Salome Vogelin's work about listening and about the fact that you're always generating. And when you start using the word entangled, people start saying, well, you, you can't say the word entangled unless you've read Barad and you've started dealing with some of these concepts. So, so I went to read it then and then reading these kind of descriptions of um, kind of coexistence and, and interdependency just was like, oh, that, that's exactly what this is. And so, yeah, so the methodology was really making the work, having that experience and then finding that it was kind of being articulated um, in theory, but by other people, and then and then once you've done that, then you sort of go back and you rethink it and you develop the work in in response to that. Yeah. Other questions from the panelists? You can also use the raise hand icon so I can see your if you have a question. Uh, Rashin. 
Um, it's less of a question, but I wanted to thank you first. This was an incredible, beautiful talk. And I loved how you brought so much poetry into, into this uh, space. Uh, and, and I felt so much affinity with a lot of, you know, the concepts that you brought up. Uh, and, and, um, and especially kind of like thinking about like immersion, entanglement, and, and, and again, like the way that you spoke to it, bringing it so much close to the body, but body as part of the environment, not as a separate entity. And, um, you know, that like immersion with, uh, with the concept of no vantage point. So there were many uh, elements that you raised and I was like curious um, to hear you more speak to it, but also some of, I was also curious about some of the methodologies that, that you're, you know, bringing that of course you kind of sh were, were presenting them in this space uh, through, through the work that you were doing. Um, so I, uh, so again, like, I feel like I don't have a concrete question for you now. I have a lot of questions and I feel like, uh, but, but, I'm, but I'm curious about that space that you're opening now with, with this sort of co coexistent that is collapses the, the boundaries and, and, and put things on the side in a way that the, the, that hierarchy is dissolved. Um, so I don't know if, if there is something you would speak to that and uh, expand a little bit more on, on, um, on that vantage point that you mentioned on immersion would be great. I guess, I guess there's two, there's two short things I'd say. One is um, this, this, this idea of kind of immersion as, um, as a term and the way that it kept being used for cocooning kind of, it actually sort of frustrated me away. And that there's, there's a kind of historical link in that, which is um, when I started making kind of audio walks, especially mass participation audio walks. It was during the rise of immersive theater in the UK um, alongside companies like Punch Drunk and things like that. And people were always describing my work as immersive. And it, and it really frustrated me because my goal was to make people present in environments, you know, not, not to separate them in the immersive experience, but to make them really actively present. So I just would be like, this isn't immersive. Um, and I, in, in recent years, sort of, I just started really thinking just the flexibility of the word because of thinking about um, that breakdown of human nature, you know, the way for me to understand dissolving that is to understand that we're constantly immersed in, in multiple onion skin layers of different things, whether that's an immediate environment. So then I started thinking, what well, do you can just reuse the word immersion to think about media that highlights and exposes those kinds of immersion. So I look at works like um, uh, Christina Kubish's Electrical Walks. I don't know if you know those. She makes these works where you have a special pair of headphones which picks up um, electrical magnetic fields coming out of um, cash points, um, electric doors, all kinds of things. So you're walking the city hearing those. So you're hearing this kind of invisible network that you're always part of that you're not aware of and so I just started thinking about that that was actually one of my starting points about saying well that is an immersive work because it's exposing what you're immersed in I guess that was um now I can't remember what my second thought was on that point um I can't I can't remember what my second but maybe that's yeah maybe that answers it or expands it a little bit we can come back to it too, if you remember. Um, Halsey has a question or comment. Yes, hey, Duncan, thank you so much. This is uh, you. I, I did have the pleasure of, of, of seeing uh, this talk at IDFA again, but it was still filled with lots of new and exciting things. So thank you um, for it. Um, I had a, a question. I really loved what you were saying about trying to make sort of your audience care about the world around you, trying to make them experience, not just experience this melding, this entanglement, but also trying to get them to, you know, care. And that's that's a that's a, a wonderful notion, something that I, you know, attempt to do as well. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that um, and about maybe perhaps ways that you've done that. I had the pleasure of experiencing only expansion and I think you you certainly accomplished that um, with some of the sounds of you know as you as you described with the, the processing of you know the water sounds on the river and whatnot uh, and, and sort of 
overwhelming you and whatnot, which did uh, you know get me to care about things. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that concept because I think it's wonderful and beautiful, and I'd love to hear more. Sure. Um, I mean, this again is like something that has a sort of long history in in my work. So the 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 reason I sort of started making audio walks and sort of you know just pre-recorded mp3 sound walks was partly in response to kind of iPod culture in the early 2000s and everyone being on mobile phones um, and this and this sense that we were very good at connecting to remote places and remote um, ideas and this uh, uh, Jean-Paul Thibault talks about the the Walkman as the listening of elsewhere that you're listening to somewhere else so this kind of disengagement and I just I wanted to kind of rethink those same tools and technologies to force you to engage with where you were so so a lot of my work has always been about how do we use these devices that are almost designed to separate you to to focus on what's around you and for me there's there's been kind of two two key approaches one is this idea of of leaving space um, and that is, you know, on a simple level, it almost goes back to uh, early 20th century documentary work where the, the audience's eye making work becomes the camera and I just want to write a piece of music that is my comment on that environment. And by not saying anything else about it, it, it gives people the kind of freedom to engage with that in a certain way. And it's also one of the reasons like a lot of the pieces I make are not going to tell you stuff about what's around you they're going to ask you to seek things out they're going to ask you to look at things in a certain way to to touch things in a certain way because I kind of feel if you're just telling people everything it's it's almost like a sit back mode even if you're kind of out there and physically engaged and there are awesome audio walks that tell you stuff about places and I wouldn't knock those but I was kind of interested in the more active you make the the participant, that then the more engaged they are with what's around you. And there's a, there's a there's also a sort of a really kind of boring level to it as well, which is the sense that we're a sort of visually orientated culture. We've become much more visually orientated. And if you see something in a documentary or on TV, you kind of value it because someone else has filmed it. Like someone's filmed this, it must be important and valuable. So if I make my pieces feel like cinema, I, you know, I use explicitly cinematic tropes in the walks, in the music, in the sort of actions and moments. The reason for that is I want people to see just the mundane every day as a, as a film, as something that they're like, oh, this is important, right? This is, this is just as important as that thing I saw on Discovery or whatever. So, so that's been part of the technique. It's in some ways quite base, but it, it really works. <laughs> All right, we have a question from the attendees. Um, are you mainly concerned with commenting on or also with influencing audience perception or behave of behavior towards the environment? Or maybe action. Ooh, ooh. I, I think I'd, I, I think I am trying to influence, but my, my approach is um, I want to create an I want them to have an experience of the concepts. So in some ways, what, what Kelly was asking about earlier, this like those concepts of multiple timescales, you know, when I found that that's what the work was doing, I, I highlight that in the work that that what's happening to you now is you're experiencing two timescales simultaneously. And so the idea of kind of influencing people for me is if we can shift that cultural understanding of what's going on, of how embedded you are, then that that's a sort of influence. Like it's the 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 data, I guess, in my work where I sort of present graphs or things like that are usually quite abstracted. I don't want to say this sea level rise is going to be a hundred meters by this year because I worry that that shifts you back into a kind of separate data space. I want you to kind of feel it. And I guess that's also why I was talking about the horror of stuff, because there's um, there's really great work that, that captures the beauty of things that we're losing. And I understand that approach. But as someone who grew up in the 80s under the sort of 
threat of nuclear winter and this constant sort of um, like this is going to be bad. You're all going to die horribly. And and the media, like the films, um, it, I think in America you had the next day or the the day after, and in the UK we had Threads. These traumatized me, and they traumatized so many people. And you saw that have a really direct action on um, nuclear um, de-escalation and things like that. So I'm sort of that's why I want to work with the horror of this stuff. I'm like I, I want to traumatize the audiences so that's my kind of influence is like i want you to come away going oh this is going to be bad because we're all going to die and the environment will be fine what what we're generally worried about is actually us I, that's my kind of feeling is when people are talking about environmental concerns we're talking about suffering that's going to happen um and so i yeah Sorry, that I've gone really dark now. Um, but and I think sound does that really well. I think sound can capture unspeakable, undescribable horror through its intensity. Dav. Um, yeah, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for this really beautiful. I mean, it was really I have a lot to think about <laughs> afterwards and thank you. And also I got, you know, I got to experience uh, an earlier piece, I think of yours at um, IDOX a couple of years ago. And that was wonderful too. The, I think it was called, it must've been dark by then. Ah, yeah, it's a sister piece to own expansion actually. It's like a sort of, yeah. Um, and so my question is, you know, uh, which is something I'm personally grappling with, but right, there is this, uh, when you're making this shift from, right, there's this very um, actually social and kind of, uh, 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 socially active and kind of interpersonally kind of uh, uh, active aspect of, um, of this legacy of kind of sound art and listening in like sound walks and deep listening exercises and all of that, right, on one hand. And then there's making the shift to something like uh, these kind of AR walks or audio walks, all of those kind of experiences. There's something so extremely, incredibly solitary about them, right? Uh, which is, you know, it also happens in a cinema, right? They talk about the cinematic, right? Where people, they do sit together, but they're like immersed in this film and you can't talk too much. And uh, which is different from some of what happens in these kind of sound walks, right? Or these, or installations or things like that. So I'm just curious, like, what's your approach to like, is that something you, you think about? Is that something you're, you've tried to deal with in different ways? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, for the years of working with sort of, pre-record like fixed closed back headphone type experiences like like you would have experienced with it must have been dark by then like there was always a frustration for me in the sense that i i want to think about how we listen to the world but i'm creating this moment and i used to just always sit on the argument of you don't appreciate light without dark and vice versa so actually that you know if you listen to a lot of my earlier works a, a sort of running motif i almost use always this single sort of eyes and pee in the sand at the end to just cut it off so that it really highlights the end of the mediated sound and, and suddenly the world around you seems much more active and present so so there was this kind of sense of I'm going to take you away from it for half an hour so that it hits you more when you when you come back it doesn't always work but it was a it was a try and then now sort of work working with hello um working with um Kind of augmented systems and transparent listening systems uh which you know there's a lot of different variety of them some are working better than others but i i think we're we're not far off having pretty seamless systems where you can hear what's around you and what's in your headphones the thing that's actually interesting for me is that there's a few systems like the the bose frames that were um out for a while where it was all external to it, so you could still hear perfectly normally. For me, that was a bit frustrating because I still want to be able to shape when you can and can't hear, but that's just sort of my artistic kind of shape. I want to be able to turn off the sound around you and really process it and then let it back in. Um, so yeah, so that, that kind of, that's where I'm really interested in this kind of entanglement at the moment in these kind of transparent systems where that blur between your, your acoustic hearing your direct kind of hearing and the mediated sound through the headphones becomes um uh, impossible to to sort of differentiate in a way um there's a there's a there's a more there's a longer boring technical thing about that as well which i discovered which is interesting but I, maybe i'll come back to that a bit later 
All right, we have a question from the audience, Alex Butterworth. He says, a fascinating reference to humans having access to only a restricted range of temporalities and also to fusion of recorded and processed sound generating a layering of past, present, future, and only expansion. Can you say something or speculate about how you compose sound to guide the user into reflections that zoom those temporali temporalities outside human scope? Um, yes, well, I just I, last month I submitted a PhD on that approach, so I, I've got a lot of words about that. Um, I'm not quite sure how to narrow it down very quickly. Um, the, the, the simple answer I would give is that I've kind of built this compositional idea which separates out um, the spatial movement of the audience, the digital content and the measurable time, which uh, I use Kronos and Kairos, the Greek term, so measurable time of Kronos, clock time that you can measure, and Kairos is the time you experience through a work. And I kind of sort of tried to develop this framework between those four things um, in terms of how they interrelate with each other. So examples might be, um, the in the audio processing it might start um uh using amplitude envelope to essentially pulse the sound around you so the the sound that you hear from the world around you is not on continuously it's actually sort of pulsing rhythmically it's kind of enforcing a temporality onto that sound around you and similar to a, a strobe light that changes your perception of the time passing around you it can make things seem faster or slower people walking around you so you have this kind of these 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 ways of working where specifically changing the the measurable time of what you're hearing can change your experience of the time that's happening right next to you in your your real kind of lived experience. Um, so yeah, that's um, yeah, it's a big area. It's hard, that's a hard one to answer in one question. But but for me, the really interesting thing was separating out this difference between the time you experience and your sense of time and how measurable time affects that. Um, like really like techniques from pop songs where, you know, pop songs would shorten, uh, some interesting writers would shorten the verse each time. So it meant that the chorus feels uh, surprising. And I kind of use techniques like that. So different periods of time would sort of gradually be getting shorter. So you'd always feel that things were happening at different moments and you'd feel time passing differently. Um, yeah, I hope that sort of answers that a bit. Josh, I don't know if you had a question. We do have a couple minutes if it's, if it's a quick oh, question. Yeah. It's, it, it might be kind of a, a large question, but I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll try to ask it, ask it quickly. Um, thank you so much um, just for the presentation and for the kind of vocabulary I think that you're bringing to the table and and I mean how you're sort of positioning the uncontrolled versus public or um, you know immersed versus entangled I think was really provocative and just gave us so much to think about um, in terms of how you're engaging with these challenges today. I'm curious you know just in terms of how you've been thinking about sound and talking about sound and again I know it's a large question but I mean what the sort of capturing and the, and, the, and communicating the sharing of, of sound can do maybe that that visuals can't do in the same way or, or, or can do differently. And I'm just curious to hear you talk more about um, your, just your interest in sound and perhaps its abilities to, to capture a certain sense of time or you know, there's a certain kind of interiority there with sound that visuals may, might you know, not be able to capture in the same way. You mentioned points of inspiration being from you know, 60s radical theater, early cinema, but maybe there's some you know, other um, you know, projects or movements um, in, in, in sound recording as well, or sound art that have also served as points of inspiration for you? Um, well, there's a, there's a couple actually. Uh, I guess one would be from a sort of acoustic ecology perspective. Um, uh, I'm thinking about sound recordists like um, Jana Wunderin and um, Chris Watson and Elsiana. And one of the things that sound does specifically on an ecological level, it can reveal changes that aren't so visually noticeable actually. So a, a really classic example of that is forest recordings. Um, uh, now I'm forgetting who 
blueberry track. Someone has been recording the same forest where they live um, for many years, and it looks exactly the same. But listening to recordings, you can hear the reduction in biodiversity. Um, and then also there's this level of the um, Bernie Krause. Thank you, um, Nada. Sorry. Um, and um, uh, and then there's also the the sort of revealing the the unheard sounds, the kind of vibrations that move through everything, which I think speaks to this idea of the fact that everything vibrates. And this is one of the things I like about that sense of um, taking down human exceptionalism, because when you go to that level of vibration and you're thinking about sort of, um, and I guess I'm leaning a li little bit towards um, some of the ideas, some of uh, Bennett's ideas around vibrant matter. I'm not an expert on that, but this this idea that sound is part of that and in terms of thinking about time sound is time i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of people who suggest that sound um creates our sense of time um mark fell has a really great um argument for uh who sell so so for those who know sort of who sells philosophy who who has uses music as an example a lot about how we perceive time this he, he uses this idea of when you listen to an oboe note how is it that after you've been listening to that continuous note for a while you still hear it as the same note how do we perceive those kind of moments of time and this develops his theory of of time mark felt he's the using music as an example to show how time works it's actually the music that's creating our understanding of time um because that's how we sort of understand things passing so i i think sound in that way as something that really lets us understand time is is just so perfectly suited in a way well thank you duncan we're out of time um and a fascinating talk and just wonderful how you're thinking about augmentation as this collision of different time periods and different spaces and making us more aware of, of also the climate in particular and the crisis and the horror of it. So very Yay. wonderful work. <laughs> um, but we are out of time. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the panelists and to the audience for being here today. And we look forward and hope you'll be here next week as well. Thank Thanks you. so much for having me.